Okay, we are ready whenever you are. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to the last colloquium of this year, the academic year. And uh, it'll be a fantastic uh, uh, way to end our uh, colloquium series. Uh, today's speaker, Professor Rashid Sunyaev, is a major figure in contemporary astronomy. <clears throat> His work has spanned from cosmology to stars, including gas. It involves theory, it involves modeling, it involves observations, and leadership of major space facilities. Perhaps the only other such person who comes to my mind is Professor James Gunn, my other hero of modern astronomy. Rashid was born in Tashkent, Uzbek SSR, Soviet Union. He comes from Tata Stock. He studied at the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology for undergraduate and the famed Moscow State University for his PhD. He had a long association with Zeldovich. In no particular order, I, only, I list only a few of his accomplishments. With Zeldovich, the development for the evolution of density fluctuations in the early universe, which predicted the acoustic peak now routinely seen in CMB maps. The sunyayo zeldovich effect, which is now a major tool of research in clusters of galaxies, and with Shakura, the fundamental theory of accretion disk. He vigorously led space-based astronomical investigations in the former Soviet Union era of the quant module on the Mir space station and the principal investigator for the Granat Orbiting X-ray Observatory. The Spectrum Ranjan Gamma mission was approved in the late 80s, but when the Soviet Union dissolved, the project died, or at least went into very long hibernation. It is a testament to Rashid's grit and determination and charm that he resurrected the mission and SRG is now finally flying as a Russian-German mission. It is really revolutionizing X-ray astronomy after a 20-year gap. Let me end with an interesting story of my first encounter with Rashid. And it also tells you a bit of the you know, past history that especially some young people uh, would not be aware at all. Uh, it was at a joint IAU COSPAR symposium held in July of 1987 in Sofia, Bulgaria. For a historical context, at that time, Bulgaria was squarely in the Soviet sphere of influence. The fall of Soviet Union was a bit over four years away in the future. The delegate stayed in Sofia's fanciest hotel with a revolving restaurant at the top of the high rise hotel. One of the evenings I organized a party at that restaurant with much drinking. Uh, I was a far, big, a far more volatile firebrand those days than now. Being, so uh, during the party, I challenged my Bulgarian colleagues to debate with me the merits of communism versus capitalism. As many of you know, I love debating. Needless to say, there were very few takers. And Rashid actually tried to gently engage with me and try to get me away from that topic. Owing to the heavy partying, I got up late the next morning and missed the morning session. And when I went to the afternoon session, I learned that a delegate, Fulvia, Fulvia Melia, now well-known professor at the University of Arizona, had been arrested by the Bulgarian KBG. Fulvia had the misfortune to attend my party and be seen with me. And after the party, had the second misfortune of calling his wife in the US on the phone to exchange presumably pleasantries. The KBG misunderstood the sequence. In any case, Fulvia was released the next day from prison or from whatever uh, office. But I was very relieved that no harm came to Rashid owing to my indiscretions uh, at that party. The next day I visited a famed hot spring uh, in Sofia downtown, which is actually well known for a series of hot springs. And in this particular hot spring, Julius Caesar was supposed to have drunk water for some medical cure. Reasoning that if the water is good for Julius, it was good enough for me, I drank the water too. I flew the next day completely sick and recovered only three days later. You see the theory of karma sometimes really does work. Welcome Rashid to Caltech. Thank you very much. 
I remember my visits to Caltech very warmly and hospitality of people there. And Sri obviously I remember all, every, meeting, every meeting with you. But uh, I made, uh, I prepared too many slides and therefore let me start with your permission. I will speak today about the SRG Orbital Observatory. And uh, mainly I wish to tell you that there are beautiful maps of the universe and what is also great that we see on the sky now significantly, I think more than 2 million of uh, sources and much more than a million of accreting supermassive black holes. And I'm really shocked because only on one half of the sky today, just after three uh, scans of the sky, we see of the order of 25,000 of extended sources and absolute majority of these objects are clusters of galaxies. And our goal was to detect 3 million are creating supermassive black holes. I, am, I have no doubt that we have now more than uh, half of this value. And we have, uh, we planned to detect 100,000 clusters of galaxies. And it seems that we are close to the half of this value now after one and a half year of the scanning the sky. This is our spacecraft. You see on the right this navigator platform produced in near Moscow in Himki. It's between Moscow and Sheremetyevo Airport. And this navigator platform was flown already at least four times to the space and uh, two, um, uh, two uh, spacecraft using this navigator platform um, are uh, hydrometeorological, they are observing from geostationary orbit the Earth and informing about the uh, situation in the oceans. And um, uh, another third mission was radio astron. Many of you heard about this. This was a mission with very elongated orbit and idea was that it will get very, very high angular resolution and it achieved the very interesting results. But I will speak about our devices on, on our SRG mission. This is Erosita, you see here, this is Erosita telescope. It's huge, 3.5 millimeters long and 1.9 meter in diameter. It was created in Germany in Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial uh, Phys uh, Physics, uh, for extraterrestrial physics in Garching. And uh, it is working uh, very well on the orbit. And second instrument is Arctic Sea uh, in Russia. This is first Russian uh, grazing incidents um, telescope with grazing incidence optics in X-rays. It's Mohat instrument. And uh, I will tell about these instruments um, rather soon. Uh, I like this photo because you see these are real people which are not smaller than I am. And uh, you see that spacecraft is not small also. This is beauty, there was beautiful launch from Baikonur launch site in Kazakhstan. This was proton launcher. We don't need so powerful a rocket, but it was given to us. And even more, there was the upper stage, the M3 booster, which also which is, uh, was designed in the end of 60s to fly, uh, to bring people to the moon. And now we used one of these uh, boosters and uh, launch was beautiful and everything went very well. And this is a spacecraft. I can tell immediately that we are very happy to have 
three star trekkers on board here. Oh, excuse me. On this, on this picture, you see two star trekkers. This star trekker produced in key. It's staying on the Arctic Sea, part of the Arctic Sea instrument. And there are two Star Trek, additional Star Trek uh, 26, which are um, which were part of the service systems of the spacecraft, but also they help to Erosita to find uh, exactly where every X-ray photon uh, is kind just to, it gives us a possibility to measure very exactly uh, the position of the X-ray sources. And obviously this is a weekly directional antenna, which is sending every day information which two telescopes are giving us. Only directional, directional antennas, two antennas, they detect this uh, signals from the Earth. If we will lose, if spacecraft will lose orientation, then any moment it can uh, see uh, what Earth is, what commands which Earth is sending to the spacecraft. Yes, on this, uh, here you see the projection of SRG trajectory uh, on the ecliptic plane. Uh, you see, this is the L2 point, 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth. Uh, and uh, of this, uh, this L2 point of the system, uh, Sun Earth system. But it's behind the Earth and Sun, so that Earth, Sun, and Moon all time are uh, on one side of the spacecraft. This helps to make cooling well, and also it was especially important for, for example, from for Planck's surveyor spacecraft because you one side is um, it's easy to make very good passive cooling, and our detectors not to forget our detectors are working uh, at temperatures between eighty five minus eighty five and minus ninety Celsius, and we flew from Earth to this L2, to the hollow orbit around L2 during 100 days. This was a very long flight. And during flight, we had uh, adjustments, calibration, and also we had the long observations of interesting areas and sources in the framework of performance verification. Yes. Now I can show you what spacecraft is doing. It's moving on the orbit around L2. At the same time, it rotates around axis towards sun. And period of one, it makes a revolution uh, around this axis every four hours. Therefore, uh, six times per day, uh, we are getting uh, short exposures to any source on the sky in one degree wide strip. You see this strip or this strip, and we are covering it in one during one day. And then uh, every day the plane of the sky shifts slowly to one degree, following sun and leaving for it's well known I follow the sun and leaving one degree wide strip on the sky map. Therefore, every source on the sky is observed six times per day, once in a half a year. And this permits to look for the short time variability of the sources. And uh, Shri told me about today about this very interesting stellar system which we detected. There is variability. And <laughs> yesterday I asked my colleagues to check every photo which we obtained from this three times in reality, we observed this source. Now it's brighter than before, uh, ten time, more than uh, 10 times brighter than before. But now we are trying to find uh, this uh, half an hour, for example, variability of the object using these pointings. In X-rays, in optics, it's already uh, observed. Mm. 
Now you see every day two giant dishes. These are the biggest dishes of Russian deep, excuse me, uh, deep space network, one in the vicinity of Moscow. This is Bear Lakes, uh, 65, uh, 64 meter dish near Moscow. And second dish is in Ussurisk. Excuse me, why it's so. A second dish is in the Ussurisk. And also risk is at the border or very close to Pacific. And um, it's very close in reality to the border, border of Russia with uh, North Korea and China. And uh, therefore, these two dishes are receiving our data. And there is also Baikonur and these bear lakes. They're sending commands to the spacecraft and to Arctic Sea device. Baikonur is the launch site in Kazakhstan. Why we are happy with this uh, spacecraft especially? Because it permits us, when we are observing extended region on the sky, uh, XMM spacecraft or many other spacecraft, they make mosaics of individual pointings. And we can smoothly scan region with dimensions up to 12.5 degrees um, wide and 12.5 12 degrees uh, long. You see so how and uh, to get very uniform picture. And you see here, for example, this Lockman Hall, uh, the region where the, uh, where the, um, um, uh, where the um, 21 centimeter light intensity is the minimal on the sky, which tells us that there is, this is uh, on the northern sky at least, this is a region with minimal X-ray absorption. And uh, on 20 square degrees, during a few days of exposure, we got, we detected here 9,000 X-ray sources. Among them, 250 are extended, 185 are confirmed clusters of galaxies, and we have spectroscopic redshift for 150 clusters of galaxies. Uh, excuse me, I will tell, uh, ask not to speak loudly. Yes, sorry. This is a Russian device, Arctic Sea, named after Mikhail Pavlinsky. It was named after Mikhail because last year, he practically one year ago, he left us due to illness. And it's pity because he was real father of this device. And I told you already that this is first, this was first um, X-ray um, uh, telescope with grazing incidence optics. Uh, you see here there are seven mirror models on optical bench plate, or you see here each of them. Uh, these seven, uh, seven mirror systems. In reality, these are seven independent X-ray telescopes. And here are seven detector models in the focal plane. Uh, every uh, uh, mirror system has its own detector, solid state detector. Um, and there are collimators. It is a hard X-ray telescope. Uh, energy range is from 5 to 30 keV. Field of view is 34 minutes. And the axis resolution is a little better than one arc minute. Energy resolution is 12% at 14 keV. But this device has excellent time resolution, 27 microseconds. For comparison, I can tell you that readout time of CCDs of Erosita uh, is 50 milliseconds. Therefore, in reality, time resolution is of the order of 100 or 150 uh, milliseconds. 
but uh, we are doing a lot of timing with this device. Here I show, this is a picture prepared by Mikhail Pavlinsky himself, this on axis effective area in centimeter square, erosita. You see it? It is very good from 300 TV up to 2.3 TV. And then it is very rapidly drops. And red is the uh, Arctic Sea. You see that it com is comparable uh, with um, its effective surface area is comparable with the Rosita at energies 5 kV. And uh, then it is orders of magnitude higher than for Rosita. But uh, because it's uh, Caltech, you see, you can see also here comparison with new star effective surface area and several times uh, Arctic is smaller. In reality, this is the efficiency of mirrors because they do not have uh, coating. Um, this is a, a situation we had time to make coating uh, on time. Uh, Yes, this is picture, image of the central region of the galaxy obtained by Arctic Sea in the 412 kV energy band during this performance verification phase. Again, this was scan. We were scanning this region and you see we, uh, we observed that we see all well-known objects here. And it was interesting that in reality, we see the diffuse emission connected with scattering of X-rays uh, on molecular clouds, connected with very old, maybe 100 or few hundred years ago, flares of Sagittarius A star. These are super, well-known supernova remnant. Again, it is resolved, you see here, it's well known, it's also good, we like it. And here you see very well known pulsar with period of the order of 150 uh, milliseconds. And uh, you see it. And uh, this green color, these are photons detected by Arctic Sea. And red color here, it is image of Chandra. There is, you see, this is uh, pulsar nebula interacts with the gas around. And this is all sky map obtained during first all sky survey by Arctic Sea. Here are 600 X ray sources in the 412 kV energy band. 60% are galactic sources. You see, excuse me, you see them in the galactic plane with galactic coordinates. And you can also see here uh, extra galactic, a lot of extra galactic sources, there 40%. Now during a uh, few tens of massive clusters of galaxies also were detected during first uh, old sky survey. But I can tell you that now we are increasing amount of objects, but mainly the extra galactic objects, amount of extra galactic objects is increasing with exposure. Yes, now we, um, uh, we go to Erosita. This is one hemisphere observed, observed uh, by Erosita. And you see the image after two, one year of observation, two scans of the whole sky. This North uh, Polar Spur, this we think here also is Erosita Southern Bubble. This is uh, Cygnus uh, region of uh, a lot of supernovae and uh, new young stars in the Cygni region. This region is very rich and bright in X-ray sources. You see it also. But let us show SRG Erosita mirror system. First, I wish to show you the, excuse me, uh, here you see the scheme, Vulture 1 uh, image, uh, X-rays there if 
they are coming normally to the surface of mirror, they are just absorbed there. And uh, it was discovered long ago that X-rays can scatter on very small angle, angle of zodo one degree in the, uh, for Erosita. You see, this is the uh, parabolic mirror. You see the scattering on parabolic mirror, then scattering on the uh, hyper hyperbolic mirror on uh, hyperboloid. And then you are coming to the focal plane. Uh, it is uh, really good optics, but optics which is, you see here, uh, every time you scatter by the mirror only to very small angle. But because its angle is very small, you can put many, many mirrors made of Miller metals and this mirror in our case and cover it uh, by gold, by a few, few hundred uh, layers of atomic gold, and then you are getting this uh, good reflection. And you see seven independent telescopes here. Each of them has, every mirror system has 54 barbaloids and 54 hyperboloids. Uh, and the effective surface area of this huge construction, I told you this diameter is 1.9 meter, uh, it is 2,400 square centimeters at one uh, keV. It's a beautiful machine and it was very interesting to see to these mirrors. And there are also, but this is mechanical contraction, but there are also magnetic deflectors which just do not permit to the uh, low energy particles, low energy cosmic rays, for example, to enter and to illuminate detectors. They are sending them or to be focused. They are, uh, these magnetic deflectors um, decrease the background. I can tell you, yes, these are dimensions, huge CCDs. Uh, uh, in uh, Max Planck lab for solid state, prepared for us these CCDs and there are seven huge CCDs in the X-ray CCDs in the focal plane. You see the dimension of each uh, just effective dimension of the CCD image uh, imager, you see it, and pixel size. Therefore it is, we have rather good 400 to 400 pixels. It's not bad. Uh, field of view of this system uh, is one degree diameter, but all uh, telescopes are practically coiled. They're observing the same region of the sky. Uh, angular resolution of the system is 18 arc seconds, average over the, uh, average over the field, one degree field, it is of the order of 25 arc second. And we are able using stellar trackers to localize all sources, X-ray sources with precision of the order of five arc second. Now additional very important subject that in 2008, when after maybe uh, four years of negotiations with German side, uh, it is not simple to, uh, to bring to Russia so big device. Therefore, there were a lot of negotiations. But finally in 2008, the memorandum of understanding was signed and uh, uh, following wording statement was included to the list. It was very interesting because um, in the beginning, um, uh, these officials from Russia, they were telling me, let us make so that uh, what are our expenses, what are German expenses, and then we will get maybe 80% of data. And I told them, do you like to have device or you have only negotiate and then to go tell goodbye? And finally, they agreed with me that this will be collaboration and for the data processing and publication of SRG Rosita results on one half of the sky will be responsible Russian scientists and German scientists will be responsible for results from another hemisphere. 
obviously launch spacecraft, uh, work on huge dishes for uh, several years. It costs much more than uh, maybe order of not much more than Erosita, but agreement was that this is friendly and we will do this. And then uh, Peter Predell uh, proposed the following uh, way to divide the sky. So this is Sagittarius A star, North Galactic Pole, South Galactic Pole, you know, <laughs> line between them, everything on the left side. Uh, Space Research Institute in Moscow is responsible for data reduction and publication, analysis, and everything what is on the right side, then Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics is responsible for this part of the sky. And there are many interesting X-ray sources, but you see this was agreement from the beginning. And now we are responsible only for one half of the sky group in Moscow and group in Germany is responsible for second half of the sky. Uh, this reminds me how uh, Spain and Portugal uh, at some moment also divided the, divided the world. And at that time, uh, Portuguese already knew about the existence of Brazil and uh, Spaniards know. Therefore, <laughs> boundary was shifted and the biggest country of Latin America speaks now, uh, speaks now Portuguese. All of you know this. Now this is the, uh, many people are interested, uh, is Erosita comparable or not, even at uh, four, six KV range with art uh, XC. And I can tell you that they are practically equal in the band four to six keV. Uh, before I showed you the picture that on the whole sky during one scan of the whole sky, um, uh, Arctic Sea detected 600 sources. And here you see the result, the map of Erosita. And during two first all sky surveys, on one half of the sky, uh, Erosita detected also 600 sources. Therefore, they are practically equivalent in this boundary spectral band. But then at higher energies, certainly Arctic Sea is much more sensitive. And at lower energies, Erosita is orders of magnitude more sensitive. I show you now additional one region where, where we scanned the sky and there was proposal to observe region where, uh, which is rather close to the center of our galaxy, it's 20 degrees in the galactic reach, 20 degrees from the galactic center. And uh, this region is good because we do not see very strong absorption of X-rays and at the same time, amount of objects uh, is rather far from confusion in our case. You see here this map of the 25 square degrees and this region uh, is very interesting. This is RGB map and you see one, so there are many supernovae, but uh, two supernovae are here are really uh, very, peak this more than a degree on the sky. And this is very big supernova of pulsar, star, t Tauri star. And this is star forming region, many, many young stars. And we see all of them here. But for me, let us see, I think it is written on the next page. Here you can see additional thing. We see the regions of diffuse emission and X-rays, not only supernovae, but, excuse me, but also the diffuse region fully filled with the warm hot gas. You see here that uh, this RGB map, blue and green colors correspond to, high, to rather high energy photons. Uh, they are radiated by gas with temperature close to millions and 10 million degrees. You see it's uh, 
for example, here it's rather hot gas. And this is inter, um, interstellar gas. And the red gas, it's much colder. Temperature of it is 100,000 and up to a million degrees. And you see they're feeling very big volume. And in between, there is absorption because here uh, there is a cold gas which, um, which absorbs soft X-ray emission. You see it or here. There is a empty because there is a neutral and, and molecular hydrogen. It's very interesting to see this and you immediately remember review paper of review papers of uh, Jerry Stryker and Chris McKee, because they were predicting that 80, 90% of the volume in the interstellar matter is filled by the hot gas, which is in reality is invisible by other methods. And Erosita sees it and it is rather beautiful pictures. And there are many stars, white dwarf pulsars. I told you that there are thousands of X-ray sources, and many of them are behind our galaxy very far. And now I will show you the picture image of Erosita X-ray sky. You see here it, this galactic coordinates, he is the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star. Uh, this object is Scorpio X1. I can tell you that Scorpio X1 is the brightest lamp on the X-ray sky. And uh, due to, how to say, um, some photons are coming to us after single scattering or on uh, parabolic uh, mirror or on hyperboloid mirror. And therefore they are not focused well. Therefore the, there is a huge halo around these objects. It is on the German side of the sky. But when we are walking here in this region of the order of 150, uh, 150 square uh, degrees are spoiled due to the additional emission coming from the Scorpio X1. There is additional background due to this single straight light. Okay. And you see here many black holes like CIGX1, clusters of galaxies, Virgo, Coma, Fornax, cluster of galaxies, Orion, Nebula, young stars, Crab, Pulsar, you see here Perseus cluster, uh, Cygnus loop about which I told you already, you see this, this Cygnus loop and this Cygnus super bubble. We can see a lot of different things. And uh, North polar spur, and I told you already about the, so we discovered with the Rosita here, huge bubbles filled by hot gas, which are expelled in two directions, we think due to enormous activity in the central part of our galaxy, maybe 50 or 60 million years ago. And this is hot gas, which is going out. And I, uh, there, is, there was a paper in Nature, but there are Fermi bubbles inside. Uh, and outside, there is a gas which we see using Erosita. Yes, but much more important were these small white dots. I hope that you see them. Many, many white small white dots. And this is million of X-ray sources on the sky. And you see also Milky Way, you see Milky Way and traces of huge explosions in the center of our galaxy. I told you already, North Polar Spur and this Erosita bubble on the south. Here on this map, uh, we see, you see the three color, uh, this RGB map again, and all 400 millions of photons, which were used to create during, we got them during, uh, during, uh, uh, during uh, half a year, during first scan of the sky. And Peter Pradell told me, I never checked myself, but he told me that 
400 million of photons is more than all X-ray astronomy got for during uh, uh, 50 years of, uh, of its existence. And you see, we got it in half a year. And energies of these photons, excuse me, uh, energies of these photons are here, red color corresponds to energies from 300 TV to 600 electron volts, green from 600 TV to 1 KV, and blue from 1 to 2.3 KV. And galactic accreting neutron stars, accreting black holes, they are very hot, and therefore we see them as a blue. And you see also a lot of objects around and the emission of our halo, which is rather low temperature emission. Yes, the first SRG all sky survey allowed us to construct a map containing almost eight times more X-ray sources than the former uh, world best map of the Rosat a spacecraft obtained in 1990 by group of Joachim Trumper. This was great achievement and 30 years uh, people were enjoying working with, uh, with a Rosat, beautiful Rosat map. But I can tell you that our map has better, much better angular resolution and has better energy resolution and also it has much more X-ray, it can absorb much more X-ray sources. What we are observing, uh, three quarters of million objects on this map are distant quasars and active galactic nuclei, powered by accretion of matter onto supermassive black holes residing in their centers. These objects are very far beyond Milky Way at distances of hundreds of millions and billions of light years. We see also 20,000 already on this map. We see 20,000 extended objects, mainly clusters and rich groups of galaxies uh, with hot gas. Excuse me. Yes. And we see also more than 200,000 galactic stars with active coronae, much more bright than in X rays than our sun. I can show you also this picture. Uh, on the left, um, you see the one hemisphere in at the energies from 0.3 to 0.7 keV. And here from 0.7 to 2.3 keV. And you see drastic difference. Here we see the emission of rather cold, warm gas in the halo and maybe in the nearby objects like, excuse me, what is occurring with me? I don't know, with my computer. Uh, you see here uh, emission or maybe from nearby, uh, nearby supernova remnants and so on, old supernova remnants, but we see this emission, it's North Polar Spur. And when we move to the harder band, 0.7, 2.3 keV, picture is completely different. You see this, there, are, there is this million of <laughs> extragalactic X-ray sources. You see these white dots and they produce the background X-ray radiation, which is very bright in the soft, in the two, this band from around one KV. Um, yes. Uh, it is a very interesting and second very imp impressive thing. You see huge absorption in the plane of the galaxy for soft X-rays from 0.3 to 0.7 keV. You see it practically. This is this plane of our galaxy warping, some warping. And here, this there is also absorption, but this absorption is much weaker. And you can see also the a little more hot gas uh, in the plane of our galaxy. Erosita has excellent spectroscopy. Look, for example, to Cygnus loop. This is a scan. One uh, image was produced during 200 second exposure per point when we were scanning the sky, only 200 seconds. 
and you see the beautiful map and uh, below I can demonstrate you now this is 400 uh, seconds per pixel this is two scans but you can see the uh, spectrum of this region and it's mainly there are mainly lines we see in reality nitrogen line oxygen like nitrogen helium and oxygen like uh, um, uh, helium like and hydrogen like oxygen lines uh, iron l shell emission neon you see magnesium silicon sulfur and all this just 400 second exposure from one supernova here you see much longer. This is several kiloseconds per pixel. This SN87A, I remember <laughs> maybe some students <laughs> were not, how to say, were still not on our, in our universe. But uh, I remember we detected um, unusual X-ray emission from uh, SN1987A due to uh, recoil effect photons were moving to the lower energy and produced power law with unusually hot spectrum. We detected it from this supernova, but now there is a normal, uh, normal thermal emission. Again, a lot of lines. And you see long pointing of XMM Newton and lines, which XMM Newton sees, and this is zero zeta. You see beautiful lines, beautiful spectrum. But I'm very impressed by the uh, observation of SS-433 jets. We are, we are observing SS-433 just on the time when it was central part of the central source in SS-433 was carbon, uh, how it's occulted by the optical star. And we saw only parts of the jets. And look here, these are photon energies, and this is uh, approaching jet. You see it with uh, negative redshift. And this is the recessing jet. Plasma is moving in jets with velocity 0.26 C, velocity of light, and you see the lines. Here in approaching jet, we see lines of silicon, silicon 13, silicon 14, this hydrogen-like and helium-like silicon, uh, hydrogen-like and, and helium-like sulfur. And uh, recessive, in the case of recessing jet, we see also beautiful lines of iron, hydrogen-like and uh, and uh, helium like iron and nickel. When I'm telling just for students, when I'm speaking about hydrogen like iron, this means that nucleus with charge 26 has only one electron. It's very strongly ionized. And this electron behaves like hydrogen atom, but with a lot of uh, corrections relativistic corrections because velocity of the electron is close to one fifth of the velocity of light in such system and also uh, but there is a, there are a lot of atomic corrections therefore lines are shifted but it's beautiful things which is possible to observe and we just observing them yes again maybe somebody in the room is studying exoplanets and uh, I was extremely interested to detect the stars with known exoplanets. And already during first uh, sky survey, Erosita detected X-rays from 100 stars with known exoplanets. This close to 10% of all nearby stars with known exoplanets on the, on the northern part of the sky. If we do not, uh, if we will forget about the Kepler spacecraft field where stars are, and exoplanets are much more distant. Uh, I can tell you that there is, this is just um, uh, systems with exoplanets, but especially interesting for us was to find um, uh, how much emit um, uh, X-rays 
the stars we having exoplanets and habitable zone. Unfortunately, we do not yet see in X-rays a single star with exoplanet in the habitable zone. Therefore, maybe uh, these uh, stars have rather much better, um, much better um, radiation environment than the uh, other stars where we detected a lot of X-rays from such from the systems. Yes, this is uh, X-ray map uh, of one hemisphere after two sky surveys and amount of the source practically doubled. And we have nearly 1 million on uh, one hemisphere. Strong variability. Tens of thousands of objects changed their brightness during half a year. I immediately, I, it will be written further, but every day on one, we, we are observing one, um, one degree wide strip, uh, 180 degrees long. And uh, then we investigate on, uh, investigating all sources in this strip, uh, what was the brightness uh, half a year ago and a year ago. And we, every day we are detecting uh, tens of objects which became at least 10 times brighter than they were uh, 10 years ago. And these are very interesting objects and now we have a very good collaboration with the Schickel Carney group and uh, we are looking for the tidal disruption events. Um, yes. Now we cover at more than 97% of the sky third time. I hope to show you uh, to show you the uh, the spectrum, uh, the results of this thing. Let's go faster. Time is running. You can see here. This is uh, in reality. Uh, this is flux here. And here is the amount of objects which have uh, higher flux than given. You see here, oh, given flux. And you see here, these are objects. And all objects which are given by the, with the red color, these are agents and quasars. And this is black is total amount of sources and uh, blue is are Gaia stars. We just correlating um, our catalog with Gaia catalog and all objects which are moving, these are obviously are uh, nearby stars. And you see we have also the luminosity function for these stars uh, and in very broad range of fluxes. And when you know it's easy for many stars of, um, of main sequence, it's possible to find the distance and we know the flux, we can find the luminosities and many other things you see here. Uh, during two whole scans, uh, 900,000 900, sources were detected in one hemisphere. And I told you that here in the high energy tail, we got a lot of variability because many sources become brighter and they influence mainly uh, this uh, tail. And here objects are already very numerous and we do not see this variability. And I told already that we detect three, five objects per day changing the flux by more than 10 times. On average, we detect one good TD can tidal disruption event candidate every 10 days. And they're being followed, uh, followed by uh, telescopes in Russia, Palomar, Kek, uh, and uh, Tsviki transient facility. You see here, you see this is a map Half year uh, of year ago, there was nothing, no one photon from this region. And now a lot of photons came to the same circle. 
and this obviously the source became very bright and here no what photon is from the same region. It's very impressive to see such things. And you all know what is the tidal star disruption. It's star is moving very close to the, uh, to the supermassive black hole and near tidal radius. If it goes so close, it enters the tidal radius, it is disrupted half of mass is going, practically half of mass is going to infinity, or half is captured and creates accretion disk. And as a result, as a result, a new bright source appears and for solar masses of the order 10 power 6, 10 power of supermassive black hole, 10 power 6, 10 power 7 solar, solar masses, you are getting, you see, up to 10 ericton luminosities and characteristic time is of the order of between one to 10 years, this object becomes very bright. I wish to show you now the, uh, how, uh, how we are very interested in the evolution of quasars. And you see here on this map, 140,000 X-ray selected quasars, blazer, blazers, AGNs, which available when uh, redshift is available or uh, spectroscopic or photometric. And this is practically our nominal um, sensitivity. And you see a lot of objects. And we are now extremely interested in this most bright objects and you see them and there is really evolution in the luminosity of these objects and most bright of them has luminosity in 210 keVs uh, with all uh, corrections uh, of the order of 10 power 47 arcs per second. We uh, have already and I will show you I hope the spectra uh, of objects at redshift five to six and so on. We detected such objects. For example, this uh, object we detected at redshift 618. It was well known in optics, but we detected that this X-ray object and this X-ray luminosity, which we are observing here in X-rays is comparable with ultraviolet luminosity from this object. You see it in much higher than infrared or uh, or radio luminosity, and it is brighter than any of X-ray, um, um, X-rays, uh, brighter, much brighter than, um, than uh, any uh, quasar at redshift Z higher than six quasars uh, have. And here is uh, 25 quasars, and from these 25 quasars, majority people, Chandra and XMM in very long pointings had very good only upper limits, very small amount of detection. And this source which we detected, its X-ray luminosity is of the order 10, uh, it is three times to the power 46 arcs per second. It's very bright object. We are detecting just ourselves a lot of objects. This is quasar at redshift 5.47. You see here, I can show several other objects that with redshift higher than five. And we continue to observe this and it's interesting, but we are, um, we have the machine learning system uh, Sagittarius uh, SRGZ, which founds what are the what are the redshift uh, photometric redshifts of different objects on the sky, and every quasar with redshift very bright, brighter than uh, at redshift higher than three, we are looking, and uh, then we are measuring spectroscopic. Uh, redshift and trying also to estimate the mass of this object. You see here, these two telescopes are 1.5 meter 
class telescope, and they all are observing uh, objects with redshift higher than four. And this is biggest Russian telescope, uh, six meter telescope. I just showed you the spectrum from six meter telescope also for this quasar 5.47. Now we are very happy because several of the interesting objects, the spectra were obtained by uh, CAC, uh, by people from Caltech. You see here, but we already found the uh, more than 200 objects at redshift higher than three with the help of this machine learning and neural uh, network and key person he is Alex Mishirikov and Josh Harunjov also very involved in organization of such observations. Marat Gilpanov is leading this program. Uh, Extended yes, objects. Yes. Uh, it's uh, about one o'clock now, just letting you know. Okay, I am finishing in maybe, okay, very rapidly. This is clusters of galaxies. You see them here how we see the extended objects in few hundred second exposure. Yes, and a number of detected clusters of how, on half of the sky in first survey 7,500, in the two surveys 1,400, uh, 14,000, and in third, in some of three uh, scans, we have 25,000 clusters on one half of the sky. And I can tell you this is unbelievable because on the whole sky, this means we have a sort of 50,000 clusters with virial mass of higher than two times 10 to 14 solar masses. And it is a lot. We, uh, this, we, our goal was to detect 100,000 clusters and we are close to half of this goal already. I can show you the beautiful long observation of coma cluster. This is coma cluster of galaxies. You see merging with nearby uh, satellite. And uh, this is the region of sort of 30 square degrees. And we have enormous amount of cl cosmological clusters of galaxies in these outer regions. But uh, coma has its own physics very interesting physics. We see our deep images produced. You see here, we see the secondary shock, primary shock, bridge between um, uh, coma and satellite. And this is the path which we are computed, computed here. And there is even contact discontinuity. We see even it. It is already in, on Astra PH, Churazov paper, and there are beautiful, images and when you have a lot of photons, you can do a lot. I can show you also Arctic Sea image of this object, there are 500, this 200 for coma. And this is um, observation by Planck in microwave. And there is, it was long prediction that if we have only Y parameter from Planck map, and the X-ray surface brightness in this band, then the ratio of these fluxes permit you, know, when you know, have some model of the distribution, to find distribution of temperature. It's so, it's written in the paper, which is on Astro PH, but this is beautiful picture, very hot gas, with temperature of the order of 15, uh, KV in the central part of the coma, and here temperature is only 2-3 KV. And you measure it not spectroscopically, but using the microwave and X-ray uh, observations. Now I'm finishing practically. Unfortunately, our map is not uniform. During the scans, all scans, uh, they intersect in the southern ecliptic pole and northern ecliptic pole. And here we have very long exposures. It is deep, deep uh, surveys for us. And you see how, uh, yes, I will show you. These are three, uh, three surveys already, this map. Marat Gelfanov just created it today. You see the map where uh, uncleaned 
two the surveys remap and two first uh, surveys. And this is the exposure in 295 surveys, practically in three surveys. And you see here sky area in square degrees, where exposure is higher than values given here. And half of the sky, half of the sky is covered now with exposure of the order of 700 seconds, half of the sky. But for example, practically a thousand, uh, thousand square degrees are covered already with exposure of the order of 4,000 seconds. You see rapidly growing and here, uh, several degrees in the region of the poles, we have confusion, we are above confusion limit and there is more than 100 uh, kiloseconds. It's a lot. And uh, here we can follow variability very long of the objects here. It's also beautiful science. And just to finish, uh, I can tell you that there is a competition now between microwave ground-based experiment, SPT South Pole Telescope and Atacama Cosmology Telescope. And this was the prediction of SPT written in 2014 that in four years, they will detect on 2,500 square degrees in deep surveys with 15,000 bolometers, they will have much higher sensitivity than erosita, you see. I can tell you that reality is much more complicated. And today the best what is there, there is Atacama Cosmology Telescope survey. And on our half of the sky, Atacama sees 1,600 clusters of galaxies. We see now the 20,000 clusters of galaxies, but obviously, with new bolometer techniques, with new telescopes. I think that microwave observations will give us a lot, but together they can produce a enormous amount of data and Erosita is doing so well that <laughs> this is from Blim and Benson paper. I can tell you that we are a little better than this. And these are people who are doing and obtaining majority of these results, group of uh, on galaxies, AGN, QSOs, and catalog uh, working group, and Alex Mishirikov is leading work on the neural um, uh, and machine learning, and you know all George Arunjev, Pavel Medvedev is working on X-rays, and Rodion Brenin also is very active with optical observation. This is group on cosmology, cluster of galaxies, diffuse sources, and solar system working group. And there is Lee among leaders here is Eugene Churazov, very productive is Eldar Habibulin, again Rodion Brenin, Natalia Leskova. You heard name, he is great theoretician, Alexei Starobinsky, Sergei Sazonov, very active. We, detected now a lot of, not a lot, three supernovae, which nobody have seen before at very high B. And these are supernovae, very unusual because they expand in the hot gas. And Andrei Bikov is helping now as a lot here to interpret this data. And there are beautiful things also. Yes, and what are our plans? additional two and a half years of scans, and then two years in pointing mode, and then uh, scans of the selected deep fields. This is what we are dreaming to do. And we are obviously grateful to many people in the Lavochkin industry, to giant antennae in BLX and Dusserisk, and Pei in Teki. Oh, excuse me. Yes, uh, who are every day sending comments to the spacecraft and telescope re receiving scientific data and sending them to SCAD, to scientists. And many thanks to people who created excellent telescope and navigator platform. We are grateful to all these people, many thanks to them. And excuse me that I was 10 minutes long, but 
there is a lot of material I wanted to tell you about comparison. We are practically now, I can tell you that we are more than 10 times better than Atacama Cosmology Telescope. And I wanted to show this data, but it's okay next time. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, uh, Rishi. That was a fantastic tour de force of all the way from stars to cosmology. Um, uh, I'd like to open this now for questions. Um, if you want, uh, please raise your hand uh, using the reaction button. And after your question is answered, lower it so that I'll not come back to you unless you want to ask another question. Okay, questions, please. Okay, uh, Bryce, go ahead. Bryce, you're mute. Oh, so, sorry. Uh, hello, Professor. That was uh, an amazing talk. Thank you for uh, giving it to us. Um, the uh, question I have is, uh, have you made any serendipitous observations of uh, solar system objects, namely uh, comets, which are known to uh, be X-ray? Oh, yes. We had observation of comet. Uh, and uh, I think that we seen, <laughs> I thought that it will be uh, maybe half a year ago, but uh, people who are involved are so much involved in the calibration. Calibra we are calibrating deeper, deeper and deeper uh, our telescopes and detectors. And uh, this uh, data on uh, Comet need uh, very good spectroscopy. We see a lot of lines from the comet, and I hope that we see several, maybe months or two, uh, you will see this paper in Astro PH at least. I insist that paper will be immediately in Astro PH when it was, would be submitted. We see one comet which is very bright. We follow, yes, we have additional difficulty. We follow or motion of the planets and even some asteroids because there is a leakage of optical light and therefore some of sources are moving, you know, but this is now we understand that this is just optical light and we see how uh, systems in the objects in the solar system are moving. And in the, some comments are also much brighter than X-rays from them. Even, uh, even we have special filters not to permit optics to penetrate. Yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, Stel Fidi. Yeah, hi, Rashid. Uh, great talk. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that you were using machine learning to find the tidal disruption events. Uh, is that mainly combining optical data where it is in galaxies, or is there something about the X-ray spectrum that you're also using? Um, obviously, we are using also X-ray spectrum, and we now we have so good statistics we, that we have. We certainly see several different types of the of the tidal disruption events. I uh, it should be written or uh, a separate talk, I can say so. But what we are doing in reality, when we are discovering tidal disruption events, uh, this is only mainly due to characteristic variability. Objects become enormously bright on the place uh, that before there was nothing. And then we are making also, we investigate uh, X-ray spectrum, which we have. Uh, and for some tidal disruption, even spectrum is just normal accretion. These are very soft. And for some, it is, there is a lot of activity, jets and so on. We also see this. And in addition, we have beautiful optical data because, uh, you know, tidal, uh, there is history of these objects also coming from, for example, from Zwicky transient factory and for some other optical data, we can see pan stars before, you know, there, is, there are many interesting things, but I can tell you, we have collection where now many tens of these objects. Okay. This, uh, Thanks. Yes. Uh, Wenbin. Mm -hmm. 
when been? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, my internet was sta- unstable. I was dropped, but now I'm back. Um, <laughs> I, I moved to another place. Uh, nice, very nice talk. So I want to ask about the uh, uh, galaxy clusters. So if I have a source uh, of a given position, would I be able to uh, ask, let's say, the either the Russian team or the German team for the position, whether there's a cluster over there, or how the how the kind of a cluster catalog uh, data, the positions are released? I can tell you our difficulty this position. It's very easy just to uh, produce a, a catalog of the extended sources because it's just machine work. But we wish also to have to estimate before months to get redshifts and so on. And this needs a lot of additional observations, optical observations, or mm-hmm. uh, we checking what is in the macro wave. We are checking our X-ray data. And when objects are very interesting, we are requesting other spacecraft to observe. Uh, we will be glad to inform, you know, people when people are telling that, I can tell you that we um, we have already collaboration on several objects. When people, for example, people from, um, from LOFAR uh, is, uh, they discovered very interesting radio source. And when we saw and they informed us, and when we look to them, we immediately recognize that there should be gas and there should be, you know, uh, some, something which is connected just with the shocks in the and propagation of jet in the plasmas and so on. And it was X-ray source, and it was extended X-ray source, and we, we have seen a lot of things that now there will be a paper in the Nature Astronomy in several weeks. You know, just because people informed us that there is something interesting on the sky, looked and we detected, yes, there is a group of galaxies, uh, we gave the image and so on, and it very well corresponds with the radio, with the radio data, which LOFAR got, low, low energy radio data. In principle, yes, question is that at least we in Russia, we are, we are very restricted in manpower. This is a difficulty we cannot just, it's easy, but you know, somebody should tell, okay, for three hours, I will not do anything, I will check and then inform person who is requesting. Or we just have difficulties with this. But in principle, all our data, we certainly dream to, publish the catalog of everything because nobody in this world cannot himself today. I told you, on our half of the sky, we now have 25,000 extended sources. Uh, majority of them are clusters and groups of galaxies. You understand this? It's impossible for our students to do this science. We should collaborate. Question, just uh, give us possible time to really to understand our device much better so that we will get more clean data immediately without a lot of special work. Hours, not uh, even days, but when we will get hundreds of requests per month, then uh, people will be unable to do my job. Uh, but, thanks, Rashid. So thanks. Uh, I'll ask the last question and we'll wind up. Uh, and I do want to remind the faculty, uh, uh, I hope you'll con- um, stay on the line, uh, sort of a kind of a small uh, virtual um, reception uh, talking with Rashid. So faculty, those are interested, please don't sign off right away. Uh, Rashid, my, uh, the last question is from me. You showed a spectrum of uh, SS-433 uh, and I was surprised to see a uh, nickel 27, uh, which is iron like nickel, because I, I don't know the ratio of um, na- you know, ni- the stable nickel, which is uh, uh, compared to the. Oh, 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 no, no, no. 20, uh, it is nickel 27, this amount of electrons. Yeah, yeah. It's no, not that's... isotope. Right, it's not what... isotope, it's absolutely stable thing. Right, it's normal nickel. Do you do you see 
this iron and this nickel in other, uh, I don't remember seeing nickel in any other object. I, I can tell you that there are X-ray sources. There are several clusters of galaxies where nickel is, where is bright enough. I then see. you have spectral resolution. People are, if you have rather good uh, hot X-ray re response, you see it. Here we see this nickel because it is uh, how to, uh, it's clear that this is a uh, recessing jet, therefore it is shifted uh -huh. a little to smaller energies. Uh, okay. You understand? 